this week on the Faculty Factory Podcast. Okay, two very important points. One is get over FOMO, fear of missing out. Hmm. Just get over it. Don't try to see and do everything. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory, friends. This is Kim Skorupski, and today, again, we have the amazing Dr. Donna Vogel. You may have listened to her podcast, the earlier one. If you haven't, you should check it out. Applying for funding, views from an ex-insider, Dr. Donna Vogel was at the NIH for about 25 years, a program officer, director of the NICHHD. She was eight years at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, my colleague, my friend, Welcome back, Donna. And I guess today you're going to talk with us about professional societies beyond getting or receiving that journal. How are you doing, Donna? Mm-hmm. I am just great, but I need to correct one maybe slip of the tongue in your introduction, which is you said I was a program director, which is correct, but then you said director of NICHD and no, I was a program director mm-hmm. in NICHD. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tomato, tomato. They're not going to be listening to this podcast. (laughs) Anyway, I am a very strong proponent of belonging to at least one professional society in your discipline for people of all career stages, students, postdocs, and certainly faculty, whether you are early, mid, or even senior in your career, for all kinds of reasons, and that intriguing subtitle refers to the fact that there is so much more that you can gain belonging to a professional society other than receiving your very own copy of the journal. Because Mm -hmm. these days, really, who even cares if you have your very own copy of the journal since (laughs) we read them all online anyway? Right. And the way I see it, the reasons for belonging to a society or multiple societies fall into two categories. One is for your work, and the other is for you. Now, there's a bit of overlap between the two, but it's convenient to divide them up that way, so that's the way I'm going to talk about them in this little snippet. Number one for your work, visibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People will see you, will see your work, and will see how good you are because your abstract has been accepted to that meeting and you're giving that talk, you're giving that poster. And there's so many reasons to want to have visibility. But as a faculty member, and particularly as a early faculty member, you're going to be looking for people to work with you, whether that is students or residents or postdoctoral fellows to work on your research with you as well as collaborators across your peers in other institutions where you will have something of mutual benefit to each other to work together. So this is a way for you to meet those people and for them to see you. And I have seen this happen all the time. People will come up to a speaker after a talk and say, I'm really interested in what you're doing. I don't know if you have any openings right now, but let's talk. And if not immediately, perhaps eventually, it will in fact lead to something, whether a job or a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Number two, ideas. You're going to get ideas to put in play in your own research program. And that's something that you should always have your antennae up about when you're at a meeting, when you go to the professional society meeting. It is valuable not only for people seeing you, but for you seeing and hearing other people. And it's not always the most obvious ways to get those ideas. Yeah, you might hear somebody in their presentation talk about a new angle that you could apply to your work or a new system or perhaps they're using an approach in a system that's different from yours, but you say, oh, wow, that works in mm, muscle. Maybe it'll work work in kidney. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And some of the lesser known or perhaps unsuspected sources might be 
talking to people in a less formal setting. It might be talking to people while you're in the lunch line or while you're at the wine and cheese reception or something, but you're always going to be looking for ideas. And one that people often don't think about because they're not even in the room is the questions after the talk. Yeah. Lots of times people just get up and leave during the Q&A because they want to get to a room down the hall to hear another one of the parallel sessions. Yeah. Stick around and listen to the questions because that's how you're going to find out what hasn't been done yet. Yeah. And when we talked about grants before, that research gap that where the hole is, is really critical to coming up with innovation and important things that need to be done that haven't been done yet. So stick around and listen to the questions. So those are two bits mm -hmm. of help for your work that can accrue to you by belonging to a society and particularly going to the meetings. The next three points are for you. And by that, I mean, of course, you in your career. Lots of societies will have an email listing of jobs uh -huh. that will go out to members only. And yeah, they'll eventually be published in more widely distributed channels, but sometimes they reach the membership first and you get first shot at some of those jobs that are, guess what, in your field because it's your society. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Number two, leadership opportunities. Every faculty member should be on the lookout for leadership opportunities. And that has a pretty broad definition. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that now, but it does not only mean being the head of something. It could mean organizing a program. It could be being on a task force that produces something tangible. Mm -hmm. But anything where you're working with a group and you are making something happen, is a leadership opportunity, and professional societies present a wealth of them. That's being right. an officer, being a member of a committee, working with the trainee groups is a wonderful opportunity, and these are all things you can put on your resume, and they also bring you attention from people outside your immediate work environment. Right. And related to that are the affinity groups that most of the societies have, certainly the larger ones, things like groups for women in that field or underrepresented minorities in that field or subspecialty groups within a larger field. Those are always fantastic opportunities to be seen and to be recognized and to be given the opportunity to lead. I will just footnote saying that about, oh, seven years ago, I was elected the president of one of my professional societies after not having seen a patient or done an experiment since 1987. Ooh. So you can be a leader in many ways and be recognized by your peers regardless of the path you take. And finally, number three, and this should be obvious by now, Networking. Mm. There is nothing like a professional society meeting for fruitful, productive networking. And particularly for you as an up-and-coming faculty member, you want to build your network outside your own institution because you need people who know and recognize and put value on your work and your potential at the national level and at the international level because you need those letters for promotion and tenure. I'm going to ask you a question and then I'm going to give you a couple seconds to think about the answer because I'm, I'm just dying to hear your perspective. But for everyone listening, we have two areas that are important for you to consider for belonging to professional society. Well, let me ask the question first. The question is, mm -hmm. I'm an off the chart extrovert. You mm -hmm. are an admitted introvert, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's and right. I, I want to hear your idea and recommendations on if I'm an introvert, I know mm -hmm. all these things are important, but I want, I, I would love to hear your tidbits and, and hints and lessons learned on how does an introvert navigate profession, professional society. And while you're thinking of that, I want to summarize for everyone listening in this little 
this little snippet here. Professional society is important for work because it provides visibility and provides you with ideas. It, they're important for you and your career. Why? Because you will be afforded perhaps sneak peeks, early um, announcements for job listings, providing you with leadership opportunities, and then networking. So I'm an introvert. I'm listening to this podcast. This all sounds great, but this is going to really be difficult for me. How does an introvert navigate a professional society in the meeting? Okay, two very important points. One is get over FOMO, fear of missing out. Hmm. Just get over it. Don't try to see and do everything. It took me many, many years to realize this because I would go to a meeting and I'd say, wow, I've got to hear all the talks and I've got to go to all the posters and I don't, I don't want to miss this plenary. And you get exhausted. Mm-hmm. You get absolutely exhausted. So you have to trim your agenda. You have to admit that you need some breathing space. You need to be able to excuse yourself and walk out of the wine and cheese reception and say, oh, I have to make a phone call mm-hmm. or anything, but just get out and breathe. Because if you are exhausted, if you are burned out, you're not going to learn anything, no matter how many talks you sit through. So that's number one is refresh your brain. Got it. There was one time, this is probably just around the time I realized this, and this is a while ago. I'm going to say this is 10, 15 years ago. It was before I started working at Hopkins, and one of my meetings was in Baltimore. And I'm going to all the talks, and I'm going to all the posters, and at some point in the middle of the afternoon, I just say, hey, I am in Baltimore. I am going to go down to the inner harbor and eat a freaking crab cake. (laughs) We and have it those saved my life. everywhere here in Baltimore, and they're actually called freaking crab cakes. <laughs> <laughs> and it saved me. Yeah. So that's number one. And the other point is very different. And it is an example of what I would take as my approach to intro- introvert interaction in general, which is start with baby steps. Start in your comfort zone. Start in your comfort zone. Yeah. Talk to people you've already heard of that you might have emailed with or you might have read their paper and now you have a chance to meet them in person. Don't just cold approach people. Yeah. Have a plan. Yeah. You can start ahead of time. You can say, oh, you know, I just read this interesting paper and and maybe this person, or you see that they're on the program, that they have a talk or a poster, so you know they're going to be there. And you just drop them an email and say, can we meet at the break on Tuesday morning? I'd love to talk to you. There you go. Baby steps. I love both of those. And because we know, and we, those of us who teach the Myers-Briggs, that extroverts get our energy being with people. So our balloon gets bigger when we're with people. The uh-huh. more people, the better, because we get our, our battery is charged. And some introverts tend to, when they're with people, their battery is depleted. Their balloon is That's just right. shrinks. So uh-huh. recognizing that, I like how you said, build in some you time. Go refresh, take a walk, go to your room, recharge your battery is great. And I have to tell you, even as an extrovert, when I started going, going to my professional society means back in the day, that was gerontology, the Gerontological uh-huh. Society of America, the GSA. Uh-huh. Uh, even though, although I'm an extrovert, I still felt like I didn't know who the these people were. And so you'd go to talks and people would talk, refer to people by first name. And there'd be this laughter and Joe this and Bob that and Sue this. And I think, who's Joe and Bob and Sue? And they all seemed to know each other, or at least I yeah. did. And so I had a different kind of FOMO that I thought, I'm not an, an, an insider, and I don't know these people. And so I kind of felt like, even as an extrovert, I felt awkward because I was the new person in the group, and I didn't know anybody. And I wanted to also tell you my my story, or those listening out there, that kind of reflects back on your networking thing, and in getting out of your comfort zone, and going to the wine and cheeses, or putting yourself out there, is that one of my my role models, like one of the, like the gods in the gerontology world is, world mm-hmm. is Dr. Fred, 
Frederick Walensky, Fred Walensky. And I just admired his writing. It was just so wonderful and so clear and just brilliant. The guy's a genius. And uh, I'd, of course, been just reading his work forever and ever and ever. And I went to a small party and he was there. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's Fred Walensky. That's Fred Walensky. And I was just so nervous and I kind of like hedging around him and kind of watching him. And the, the strangest thing happened. Someone, I went up to him and introduced myself. Oh, you know, Dr. Eva Kahana, I'm going to Case Western. La, la, la. I love your work. And he was very kind and just very sweet. And the person, like two people in front of us, dropped something off of his plate, like this, this kind of a mess. And my, and I'm a neat freak, thanks to my mother, Scarlett Elaine, but I'm so obsessive compulsive about neat, like it's, it's crazy, like dropping the toothpicks in, in that movie. I was like, you know, Wapner, Wapner. I couldn't, I, I was like torn between this is Fred Walensky in front of me. And there's this guy that just dropped all the stuff on his plate. And I wanted to go clean up, but I thought, is, what do I do? I'm in this strange. And Fred jumped over and he started cleaning up. So I was like, okay, whoo. So he and I started cleaning up, and that just led to this interesting relationship where we got in this big debate. He was uh, we talking about cookies. Um, I like double stuff Oreos. He liked Hydrox cookies. We went for years. I called him Hydrox. He called me Oreo. And I'm telling you this silly Hydrox story. I call it the Hydrox story only to make a point that that you just you don't know till you know. You don't know till you try it. Here I'm thinking mm-hmm. this Fred Walensky is this famous guy who I, you know, dare not even speak to. And he's just like me. He was on his hands and knees at a party. We're cleaning up a mess. And then we're talking about cookies. So you just you just never know when there's a, a potential relationship there just by trying. And there's no no harm, no fault. Right. And if the person, the woman or the man is not nice, oh, well, mm-hmm. move on, right? Yeah. Yeah. There That's you go. Story. Is there anything you'd like to close with? Because this is a great snippet, and I think you've given us great advice about um, the benefits to our work and ourselves when we join a professional society and attend the meetings. Yeah? All I would add is when you're in that buffet line and there's somebody that you want to talk to who's standing in front of you, don't talk about the weather. Talk <laughs> about the meeting. Okay. <laughs> don't you mean don't talk about cookies? Darn it, I blew it. <laughs> Well, folks, you've been listening to Dr. Donna Vogel. Uh, she does freelance, freelance work. She, uh, is, does career development, skill building. She will come to you, come to your campus and consult with you. She's on LinkedIn and you can contact her at drdonnavogel at gmail.com. That's dr period Donna period Vogel, V-O-G-E-L at gmail.com. Thank you, Dr. Vogel. Great talking with you, Kim. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.